Uh, Bruce, are, are, are you stopping to have a, a, a glass of water or are you finished your, your talk? No, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm, okay. I'm done, done. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. No, um, I, 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 I think, I think, I think we should have a real discussion and uh, we're very open to, to questions and um, very excited to be on this call. Uh, Bruce, uh, what we're going to do is the, the next thing from a committee planning committee point of view is uh, just to give the, the members of the association who are online uh, a, a bit of the insight that that um, the planning committee uh, discussed amongst themselves. And Rob Fiedler is the one with the experience in that. And uh, he's going to just take a minute and talk about it from the perspective of the planning committee. And then we'll turn it over to questions. And as Sarah said, she will be managing the, the questioning and be done by chat. Um, and I'm glad that you have time to stay around because I'm sure there will be questions. Rob, do you want to... Uh, I don't see you here. There you are. Okay. Can you uh, can can you just give a bit of perspective on this, please? Hey, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Yeah. So uh, it's it's a bit hard to follow up after two people who've went through it in great detail, but uh, coming at it without seeing any renderings and and simply approaching it um, a year ago during an appeal as a zoning bylaw, there, there are certain uh, objectives that the appellants from the neighborhood had. One of the key ones was ensuring that the development didn't end up being predominantly small one bedroom apartments. There was a desire for this using provincial language to be a, a real complete community with a range of different types of households, including families. And there, there is no way to mandate that families will live on Pier 8. So from a planning point of view, the best you can do is create something that would be attractive to families. And an important part of that is ensuring that you have enough uh, units that are large enough. So uh, two bedrooms or more, uh, somewhat larger in square footage and, and so on. And so uh, the, the settlement that was reached last year used this mechanism to free up space on the rest of Pier 8 by moving some of the density into a tower, potentially. The, the planning committee has discussed this uh, in recent weeks, and as, as you'd imagine, it's um, quite a significant difference from the, the sort of things that people have talked about over the years, uh, where there was an eight-story height limit. But there's a general consensus that um, a tall signature building could enhance this project. And so you have a recommendation from the committee that, that we go forward with something of this nature. I don't know how much more detail you were hoping for, Herman. Is that enough? No, that's, that's great. I, I just want to um, add one thing to this conversation though about family housing. And uh, I see that Sean is on this conversation and Sheree, that's great. Um, one of the things we talked about when we started on this process back in 2004 or 5 was the extent to which PRA could provide a supply of children that would do something to stabilize the, the continuation of the two schools in the neighborhood. And uh, so there's, when we were working on this uh, last, uh, at last year, the goal was to find ways to increase the number of children on PR8. And the, the idea of moving some of the density into a higher building and then releasing some of the density mm. in the rest of the project uh, became uh, very attractive. Uh, so that um, while this is hard for me personally to adjust to, um, I, I think we, uh, the committee has said, we accept that this is a concept that should go forward for, for study there are five or six issues that we have put in our report that um, we expect to be dealt with over the period of time. Uh, this is not going to be done overnight. There's a whole process that's going to involve the city with its normal planning process. And I'm sure there will be more work done by both Calvin Brook than by, by Bruce. Um, I, I do want to say this though, that on behalf of our committee that we have had 
ex very good cooperation and patience uh, from the two architects in explaining to us in detail, as they have to our members tonight, and to answer questions and to be very sympathetic and understanding of what our neighborhood is all about. So with that, uh, if I can turn it back over to Sarah and the questions, if you can use your chatting system on your screen and Sarah will manage to try and get them on our screen one at a time so that the appropriate person can answer them. Sarah, back to you. Thanks, Herman. Okay, so I've had a few questions come in already and I can just, uh, I'll put them forward and then between Joe and Bruce and Alyssa and Kelvin, you guys can uh, choose. Um, oh, uh, wait, just one second. We're just gonna, we got a little bit of a technical error here. Um, we're just going to, um, oh, Rob, if you could just stop sharing your video there for a minute. That would be great. I'm just going to try. Um, so our first question while I uh, work on this is, um, um, is about parking. So we didn't really talk about parking at all. Um, so just kind of where will the for the people who live in the 45 uh, stories be parking and, and uh, talking about accessibility um, and parking as well. Well, I think I can answer that one. I mean, the parking will be uh, within the Pier 8 land. So uh, it, it's going to be underground within the Pier 8 lands. And Pier 8 lands, just to help people understand, is the whole of the picture um, that was displayed more than just Unit 16, correct? Well, Unit 6, uh, so Block 16, will have, that building will have the parking below ground, below that building. Great. And uh, another, we have quite a few uh, questions about- Sarah, if I can just interrupt for a second. Yeah, of course. One of, the, one of the components of the settlement, I think everybody should understand this, was that the they parking on Pier, the uses on Pier 8, that parking has to be provided on Pier 8. Um, and then it but actually when it goes further than that, and that is that all the parking for what the city is proposing on uh, six and seven as well, the parking has to be north of Guy Street. So we have as part of the settlement, a firm commitment from the city that parking, all the required parking for those activities must be north of Guy Street and in connection with Pier 8 must be on Pier 8 itself. And that's in writing and it's part of the deal. Sorry, thanks. Seth. Great. Um, another question that we have is just about accessibility of units, um, whether that's the townhouses, whether that's the tower, um, whether that's the use of the greenway, um, just how you guys are combating accessibility and making it uh, friendly for those with disabilities. Does the city want to answer that one? Or do you want us to answer it? Bruce? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for the buildings. I mean, the buildings will meet all of the requirements for universal accessibility. I mean, you just have to do it. And uh, I think it's, 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 you know, it's a, it's a detail of design, very, very important. Um, GH3 are actually designing and looking at the whole question of the greenway, which is, uh, very, very interesting and as part of that because it is uh, a green spine, it will be very accessible. It's where people can go and I think it will be beautiful and more, maybe more protected because of its location just inboard of the water's edge. But uh, that's a great question and it's just going to apply to the landscape, the muse and the building and uh, yeah, it's, it's what every every building we do you have to you you can't you can't just avoid that you you must um another question that we have is um, a lot about flooding um they heard the underground parking and so now they're asking um well are you parking underwater you know how are we combating <laughs> some of the flooding issues 
Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're not going to park on the water. I mean, we're going to design the buildings and we're going to do what we need to do from, uh, uh, in order to create the level of, of, of parking underground. Just so you know, we've done a lot of work along the waterfronts. I mean, uh, if, you ever, if you've ever seen Pier 27, uh, that's basically right against the lake. And we've gone down five stories. So uh, we're going to build, we're going to meet all the uh, standards uh, as per the building code. And, uh, you know, it's been done, all, it's been done and we're going to do it there. Great. Um, and let's see if any other questions come in here. Oh, Rob, do you have a, do you have a verbal question? Oh, I'm just uh, monkeying around with my computer. Sorry, but I'm in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll just uh, try and uh, stop you here. Objecting again. to a gigantic, uh, big, uh, uh, forty-five-story uh, tower here. So. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, there, there was uh, Sarah. There was one question that flashed by on my screen. Uh, Mm -hmm. Does it make any difference in terms of the parking? This is really addressed to Joe, and you may have already answered it, but uh, that's a landfill site uh, full of junk. Um, uh, uh, do you have any concerns about being able to put the parking in a, in a landfill site that's below the water level of the, of the harbor? I think that's the question that I saw going by. Um, yes, I'm very concerned. I mean, it's going to be costly. Uh, it's something that uh, we're working on now, but we've done it before. And it's been done throughout Toronto. Vir you know, if you look at all the lands along the lakefront, they're virtually all landfill sites. This is not unusual. Okay. And, and Carol just asked, uh, what, what happens to, are, are you involved in remediation of the soil? No, the city is going to handle that. That's part of our, that's part of the agreement. Okay. All right. Sarah, back to you. Um, I have a question here. It says, how does each story increase in the signature building subtract from the story level of the rest of the units, like the townhouses? I'm, I'm trying to interpret the question. The I think just because, like, I guess they're just trying to understand that if we go up 45 stories, how does that change the units on the rest of, like, development uh, uh, on Pier 8, right? Because you're, oh, you're okay. 1645 or whatever that number is. Five, the 16, I think Herman, Herman talked about that right at the beginning, that it, it, it probably means that some of the buildings on the other blocks are lower in scale. And, and dense and, and number of units, you know, because there's a, a total of 1645. And uh, so, so that I think, I think Cal talked about that as well. There, there's some uh, redistribution. Yeah, and I, what I'd like to add to that is that there's an, there, so there's an existing zoning bylaw that's been worked through, and we're going we're gonna to work within that existing zoning bylaw. That's basically it. Okay, great. We have uh, another question about uh, what remediation to the soil is being done. Um, Chris? Um, so I can kind of maybe answer that. Uh, um, so the remediation at the very beginning of this process, the city's actually undertaken uh, the remediation of the site Anyone who's been down there recently, you see that we're actually building the underground services, the above ground, the road network, uh, and the city retains all those lands. So those, those aspects there uh, needed remediation or some remediation as we were doing it. I'll kind of touch on the, on the flooding piece as well, just to make sure everybody's clear. Anyone who's been down to the site recently, or at least prior to the closures, uh, realize that the shoreline is actually built considerably up. The site itself is actually built considerably up. So when we're talking about flooding on Pier 8, uh, there is no flooding uh, issue itself on Pier 8, as opposed to say, uh, some of the other lands, uh, namely over by Leander. On the, uh, 
key thing to remember on remediation is we've been working through a process with the Ministry of the Environment on record of site condition and certificate of property uses. That's something the city's undertook for about four years now. We're in the final throes of that particular uh, aspect to get it signed off. And these buildings will be built by, uh, with a record of site condition from the ministry on them. So as far as remediation goes, there's no remediation per se that's required. What are, what's required from the builder will be mitigation measures in how they construct the buildings uh, that really affect the, uh, the, the, uh, the aspects of the remediation that's on the site today. Thank you. Um, there was also a couple of questions about an observation deck being included in uh, the 45 story or a public space of some sort. Um, so I think I'll answer that one. It's very difficult to have people that live in a building uh, that's a private building have a public space within it. Uh, it's just, it's something that uh, will be very difficult to do. So, the, Joe, what you're saying is the negotiations on that will not be easy. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, we've been thinking about it since it was mentioned the last time. It's, I mean, I don't know if it's ever been, you know, we're trying to figure out where it's been done. We're, we're, we're going to look into it, but it's not something that, you know, we would lean towards. Let's put it that way. I think you're right, Herman. Um, I also have a question about wind. Um, so it says, um, the concept of a beacon speaks to the history of the harbor. It's the role as the in, in entry point for the generations of immigrants as they arrived and as they made their way up James to the city, a lighthouse, if you will. But a practical question concerns the wind and the wind shear. Um, this, this person lives up on Houston Street and there are often micro bursts of wind up off the harbor that are very strong. Um, has this been addressed? We, we will, we're going to be studying it. We're very aware of it. And, you know, I, I grew up in that neighborhood. So I, actually, what's really interesting is I grew up in the neighborhood, but I never thought it was windy. When I, when I started to think of windy cities is when we started working in Chicago. But on the waterfront, it's very windy. And so both Herman and Joe have talked about, you know, the need for uh, protective measures, you're really handling the microclimate. I think the form of the building is a good start. It'll be modeled. It'll be modeled. You can digitally model the microclimate and we'll definitely do that. We definitely want to protect the pedestrian comfort level at grade in the greenway and on the site to the maximum extent possible. And we want people to be able to get in easily to the front door and open that door. So it's a big concern for us as well. And any amenity space, as I said before, that in some of the earlier um, iterations, they, they, they had windscreens around them so that for the residents, you could go outside and be protected. Great. Um, just going through um, some of the other questions here, just making sure I don't miss any. Um, the harbor is a major bird migration area. Was any thought given to the birds and their flight path and collision with the building? I, th I think the way we've designed the building is a lot of birds get confused by the reflections. They see the glass and um, they don't realize it's glass and it's too late. And when you have glass exposed, we did a George Brown healthcare campus on the waterfront in Toronto where it's right on the migratory path just like most of the lake. Uh, we, we added a frit pattern. It's a dot pattern. There are rules for doing it. There's an organization called FLAP uh, that is trying to protect uh, you know, birds from, from dying um, and, and it's been very successful. So where the glass is really up front in the facade, you, you have to do that and certainly for the first 40 feet or so. And then I think the design that we have uh, put out so far, thought about so far, the balconies are recessed and the glasses in shadow. But we, we, we would go to FLAP and get their, their opinion on it. It's a very important issue. So many birds die every single year. Great. Um, we're just uh, almost out of time. So I just have uh, two more comments um, and questions. Uh, one of them was in regards to the observation deck, uh, could you put an elevator 
uh, to that floor as an observation deck that has no access to the rest of the building. It was just uh, a, a is the city well I mean uh, I mean I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question other than you know it can be discussed I mean it's really very early in the program to start really uh, you know delving into those kind of details uh, but you know I'm, I'm, I'm sure Herman will bring it up as we move forward and we'll we, you know we can start talking about it but you know I I still stand with what I've said. It's very difficult to have a public, who pays for that? Who pays for the elevator? Do you charge people to go up to the observation deck? There's a, there's so many different things here that need to be discussed with that. And it's just, it just uh, it's something that we've never done. That's that's all I'm gonna say. That I, you know, we've never done it. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, just one more question about accessibility. Um, with uh, busing and darts and a couple of those other things, is it uh, has any thought been put into those as well? Into busing, I, I'm not quite sure I understood that question. Yeah, so like there's like a, we in Hamilton use what's called darts, it's like an accessible bus. Yes, yes. Is there is that is will these towers and the location be easily accessible through that? I th I think. It's a good point. I think one of the areas that we looked at, if you, if you looked at the ground floor, I don't want it to be pulled up, but we actually had two entrances. Uh, one was on the southwest and one was on the northeast, uh, sort of in an area where we have access to parking and so on. And I, I, I could see you could pull off very close to that entrance on that side. Um, or, or I imagine that we're going to somehow magically develop some kind of glass windscreen near the entrance that might produce some environmental mediation, you know, when you're on the, between the building and the street. So that, that might work. But these are all really good questions. These are, I'd say, refinements and adjustments to uh, the design that just makes it better for everyone. So. You know, good question. Yeah, you can see there the, that plan. He he did bring it up. We, uh, maybe so. There there is a bus route. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, as a developer, we would like to see that continue as it is, right? So we would we would be we would continue to push for the bus to still come down into Pier Eight and go through Pier Eight. So. See, you can see on that drawing, it's just, there are a lot of lines that are curving and there are radiuses of, uh, there's a little plaza, a little area where you can do all the vehicular turns and there's a second entrance. It's, there's a little darkened triangular dot in a vestibule coming from that side. So that, that might be good. And, and, and the dotted line is uh, an area that's covered. You know, it's open but covered. And so that, that might work. I think you were talking about more specialized buses, not just the public bus system or things like wheel trans or, um, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of things that come, will come to the building. And so you want to really make sure that they're all accommodated. Sorry, Bruce, maybe uh, Chris here, I'll just kind of chime in. Obviously, uh, transit transportation in all its different forms is, uh, is part of the broader West Harbor plan. Um, to be fair to the developer and the architects and, and uh, Brooke McElroy, uh, that's not really part of their purview, that's part of the, the city's uh, aspect. And it's part of our plan moving forward uh, is uh, to increase transit usage down here in the area, uh, increase uh, bike share, increase all sorts of forms of, of both active transportation as well as, uh, as, well as all the aspects uh, to that. Uh, and for this group, uh, certainly the city's worked with uh, NEN and, and uh, many of your members to look at ways on how we can do that at the same time as mitigate the, uh, uh, the effects that it has on the neighborhood, both uh, many of the traffic calming measures as well as uh, some of the measures that it were formed through the settlement that we re reached at the LPAT as well. Um, so I do want to make sure that there's a distinction on the aspect of transit and transportation usage whether it be in the traditional form or in darts or 
in any other form that, that is. And that's really the city as opposed to the developer. Great, thank you for that clarification. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, just so one more question, because uh, we are running out of time. Um, if just as a <laughs> reminder that you can uh, continue to submit your questions to uh, Neen President, um, and Andrew can correct me, or maybe you can, Andrew, if you could just type in or Annabelle the address into the chat, um, you can uh, email any of those like questions to us and then they'll direct it to the planning committee and then we can um, address some of these concerns um, later on in further discussions. Um, so just one more thing was, can we hear more about the work GH3 is doing on the Greenway and how the pedestrian views between block 16 and one connect to the perimeter of the park and the Greenway? Um, I'd like to talk to that. First of all, the Greenway uh, is is not our property. It, it, that we should, you know, we should clarify that. The Greenway belongs to the city. So ultimately what happens with the Greenway is gonna be the city's decision. We're more than happy to be involved in that if the city wants us to be involved, but we really can't comment on city land. I mean, it's up to the city. We've looked at it and, and you know, and we've come up with some ideas, but really it's, it's, it's the city sh that should comment on what's, what's going on with the Greenway. We shouldn't, because uh, it's really up to the city at the end of the day where that's gonna go. Does the city want to comment on that? Well, just actually to re reiterate uh, what Joe said, I mean, uh, yeah, the Greenway itself, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure on the question, maybe it's two different things. Bruce actually did make mention of the designer on that. I don't know if, if it's, uh, um, if the question's specific about the Greenway or whether it's about the building uh, that's adjacent to the Greenway. Mm -hmm. With that said, as it relates to the Greenway itself, as Joe uh, uh, made mention, it's a city project. Uh, that will be undertaken. Uh, Waterfront Shores will likely develop or, or actually physically build it and construct it as part of, of their development going forward. It'll be uh, purely to the city specs. It achieves multiple objectives. It's an east-west uh, pedestrian kind of linkage, a bit of a green space, but it also serves a, as a bit of a stormwater management uh, channel as well. And there'll be uh, decisions that will be made over time uh, with the city on how we actually develop the greenway itself. Great, thank you so much for clarifying that, Chris. Um, Herman, before I uh, turn it over, um, Andrew just wanted to say a few things. Right, well, I think the planning committee is finished. Um, and so I, we can turn it back over to, um, unless there's a member of the committee who wants to say something. I think it goes back to, uh, to Andrew now. Yeah, hi, thanks. So for some reason I can't, my video turned off and it says that I cannot turn it back on. <laughs> Apparently the host turned me off, um, but oh, sorry, it, Alyssa. it's okay. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know, thank you so much for having us here uh, to talk to you about our project. And we are really in the beginning phases of it. I know it seems like there's been a lot of work done and Waterfront Shorts has some really amazing drawings, but um, we are still from the city's perspective in our urban design phase of looking at the site, what is the opportunity for height? We have to meet with our Hamilton's design review panel, hopefully in June, to present this information to get um, feedback from them, and as well as develop those really good urban design guidelines um, to bring forward to council for approval. And then we will sort of hand the torch over to uh, the Water Waterfront Shores Consortium group to, to manage the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment and that's when you'll start to see more of their drawings come to life and and some of the things that you've seen here come to fruition um, and we do still need to do a lot of consultation with the community i know we've met with you guys um, but we do have some other uh, groups that want to meet as well and we, we want to have a public meeting with everybody and it's really difficult and we're trying to figure out how to do that right now so if we weren't in this situation of self-isolation we probably would have already had a big event um, somewhere in your neighborhood and invited everyone but right now we're still at the city trying to work out how we can connect with everybody um, to be fair not everyone has access to technology like we do so if you guys have any ideas of how we can get some of this information out the problem is with just drawings and no words it's really hard to explain what 
we want to present. So um, we have thought about maybe doing a pre-recorded video of a presentation that might help as well. But if you have any other um, groups or people that you think may benefit from having a smaller group chat through a virtual means, we can do that. But otherwise, we do intend on having a hopefully a public event when we're able to meet again. Um, so I'm not sure, I can put my email as well if you want in the chat. If anybody wants to send me uh, directly any questions, you can do that as well. Um, that would be great, thank you. Okay. Thanks. And um, thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Alyssa. Yes, and thank you also. It was very nice to be on this call. I look forward to more discussions. Thank you, Joel. Okay, Andrew, thank back you. to you, we're done. The planning committee is now finished. So I, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to, to thank everyone, the, the NINA planning committee, the developers, the architect, the, the city at, uh, at giving us this presentation during this, this trying time of, of COVID and everyone self-isolating. Uh, it was great to, to start this discussion with everyone and understand the current planning processes and the next steps going forward for, for our waterfront. Uh, we're looking at, at, as Alyssa Mahood said, starting a dialogue, uh, a back and forth. This is not the, the end plan. It's not set in stone. Say we're, we're going forward. Uh, so please reach out to the city, reach out to the, the Nina board members, myself, Herman, John, Sarah, Annabelle, Curtis, uh, Herman, or through email. Uh, and we look forward to hopefully having future discussions like this uh, or in person if the virus is solved.